November 6, 1980, you're sitting in IBM's corporate headquarters, the most powerful technology company on earth. Across the table from you is a college dropout who looks like he practices handshakes in the mirror. This kid has no brand, no company, no hardware. He vaguely sounds like Kermit the Frog, and he's asking you to sign a contract that doesn't make any sense. You don't realize it, but you're about to sign the worst deal in corporate history. A deal so lopsided it created a $1.4 trillion company and destroy yours. What you also don't know is this kid doesn't even have the software he's promising you. He's running a complete bluff that's about to become the foundation of a $5 trillion industry built on dependency, extraction, and systematic wealth transfer. In that same 44-year-old playbook, it's about to be destroyed by the very thing it helped create. I'm about to show you how artificial intelligence is dismantling the software industrial complex one algorithm at a time, and why what happened to IBM is about to happen to every software company on Earth. But here's what makes this story story even more incredible. IBM wasn't just caught off guard, they ignored decades of warnings. 1968, Martin Gotts created the first software patent for a sorting algorithm. He actually sues IBM for copying it and wins what equals $11 million today. Later sells the same patent for half a billion dollars in today's money. Same year, Douglas Engelbart demonstrates the first computer mouse and graphical interface in what's called the mother of all demos. You can watch the footage on YouTube, it's all there. This man and literally invented the future. Xerox Parks, Alan Kay invents the GUI, the tablet, and basically everything Apple and Microsoft would later build empires on. The technology that would make trillions of dollars was sitting right there in their lab. So everybody saw the future except the people running the future, but it gets worse. Kodak invented the digital camera in 1975. Steven Sasson, their engineer, built a working prototype that captured images on digital cassette tapes. Kodak's response? Eh, who cares? They literally buried the technology that would have saved them. 2000, Blockbuster could have bought Netflix for $50 million. Reed Hastings pitched them personally in their Dallas headquarters. They laughed him out of the room. Who wants to wait for movies in the mail? Yahoo could have bought Google for a million dollars. One million dollars. Larry Page and Sergey Brin were graduate students who just wanted to focus on their research. Google's worth $2 trillion today. Nokia thought smartphones were a fad. Their CEO said the iPhone would never catch on with with business users. Nokia went from 40% market share to bankruptcy in five years. Why do titans always miss the future? Because they're optimized for the present. They can't see the tectonic plates shifting beneath their empire. Back to that 1980 meeting. IBM is panicking. Apple's personal computer is taking off and IBM is getting left behind. They need an operating system for their PC project and they needed it yesterday. Enter Bill Gates, 25 year old Harvard dropout running a tiny company called Microsoft out of a strip mall in Albuquerque. He walks into IBM with nothing but audacity. Here's the beautiful part. Gates promises IBM an operating system he doesn't have from a company that barely exists for hardware that isn't finished. The terms he negotiates, IBM can use the software, but Gates keeps the rights to license it to everyone else. IBM lawyers think this is brilliant, one less liability for them to manage. What happens next becomes one of the most pivotal deals in technology history. Gates leaves that meeting knowing that he needs an operating system fast. He doesn't drive straight to Seattle computer products, but within months, Microsoft quietly approaches them. In July 1981, Gates buys the rights to an existing operating system called QDOS for $50,000. And little did they know, Seattle Computer Products has no idea their little operating system is about to power IBM's revolution. He modifies it, rebrands it as MSDOS, and licenses it back to IBM. Then, and this is the genius part, he licenses it to every other PC manufacturer on Earth. Welcome to the software industrial complex. And it's been running the same playbook ever since. That 1980 deal created a template that every software company follows today. Let me show you exactly how that extraction machine works. Let me tell you about Mars Inc. Yes, the candy company. In October 2015, they did something unprecedented. They sued Oracle Corporation in San Francisco Superior Court. What happens to Mars is documented in public court records. They've been Oracle customers since 1993, 22 years of paying their bills, following their contract. Then Oracle launched what they called a license review. Mars provided Oracle with 233,000 pages of documentation during the audit. Let me repeat that number, 233,000 pages. But it wasn't enough. Oracle demanded Mars pay additional licensing fees based on two issues, how they define users in their agile software, and here's the key part, how Oracle is running on their VMware 
software environment. Oracle's argument? Oracle programs are installed on any processors where the programs are available for use. Third-party VMware technology specifically is designed for the purpose of allowing live migration of all programs to all processors across the entire environment. Translation, because VMware can move virtual machines between servers, Oracle claimed Mars needed to license every server in their entire data center, whether Oracle was actually running on it or not. But here's where it gets interesting. Mars fought back. They filed for declaratory judgment, asking the court to force Oracle to limit their audit activities to what was actually in the 1993 contract they'd signed. Oracle faced a choice, defend their licensing interpretation in court with a judge and public record, or make the problem go away quietly. Two months later, both parties filed a joint motion to withdraw. Mars then filed to dismiss the case with prejudice, meaning they could never bring the same claim again. Now, what are the odds that Mars, after providing 233,000 pages of documents and filing a federal lawsuit, just decided to give up and pay Oracle everything they wanted? More likely, Oracle settled out of the court on terms favorable to Mars, sealed under a non-disclosure agreement, because the last thing Oracle wanted was a judge examining their licensing interpretation in public. This isn't isolated. According to House of Brick Technologies, an Oracle licensing specialist firm, Mars versus Oracle was the first time any Oracle customer had taken them to court over VMware licensing disputes. Think about that. Thousands of Oracle customers run on VMware. Oracle has audited many of them, but none had ever forced Oracle to defend their licensing interpretation in court until Mars. Oracle's contracts use deliberately complex language. They define user as anyone who directly or indirectly assesses or benefits from data processed by Oracle software. Under that definition, if you print a report and show it to your boss, your boss needs a license. Industry experts, including House of Brick Technologies, report that nearly all known Oracle VMware licensing disputes have been settled out of court, with no major cases resulting in a public legal precedent. Every single dispute, never in court, never with a judge examining the evidence, but here's what makes the pattern so revealing. When Oracle has solid legal ground, they fight. In 2010, they sued Ramini Street over software support services and fought it through trial, appeals, and multiple court rulings. The result? Oracle won decisively, tens of millions more in costs and fees. The Ramini Street case dragged on for over a decade because Oracle knew they could win. They had legitimate copyright claims and they proved it in court repeatedly. So so here's the question. If Oracle's VMware licensing interpretation is as ironclad as they claim, why do they consistently choose confidential settlements over establishing legal precedent? With billions potentially at stake across the industry, any reasonable company with strong legal grounds would want that precedent established. Yet Oracle consistently chooses silence over certainty. The Mars case revealed another Oracle tactic, contractual amendments that require customers to implement network and storage isolation for their Oracle workloads. If you've signed one of those isolation amendments after an Oracle audit, you may want to consult with legal counsel. The Mars case suggests Oracle has been using questionable tactics to extract additional revenue from customers who are already in compliance with their original agreements. Oracle isn't unique. They're just the most documented example. The entire software industry has perfected five extraction mechanisms that the Mars case beautifully illustrates. First, indirect usage expansion, redefining basic terms to capture more licenses. Second, compliance weaponization, using audits to generate revenue, not ensuring compliance. Third, integration prison, making switching so expensive that customers accept abusive terms. Fourth, feature inflation, adding complexity to justify higher costs. Fifth, relationship manipulation. As Palantir's CEO admitted, I enjoy humiliating people who have better steak dinners. But here's what Mars and Oracle couldn't have predicted in 2015. A technology was emerging that would make this entire extraction model obsolete. Here's the ultimate iron that proves history is repeating itself. Google invented the transformer model, the T in ChatGPT, back in 2017. Eight researchers published a paper called Attention is All You Need. It's available on ARX. You can read it yourself. Now, their own invention has created the fastest growing consumer application in history. ChatGPT reached 100 million users in two months. It took TikTok nine months, Instagram two and a half years. Meanwhile, Google's own ChatGPT competitor, Gemini, struggles for relevance in a market they should dominate. Google faces the exact same innovator's dilemma IBM did in 1980. They can't cannibalize their search revenue, even though AI is about to do it anyway. And then there's Apple. They've done something unprecedented. 
They're integrating OpenAI to power Siri's AI features, supplementing their own technology with an external AI system. It's the IBM software deal all over again. Apple thinks they're solving a big problem. OpenAI thinks they're building an empire. Even the Siri co-founder called this likely a short to medium term relationship. But here's the thing about short term relationships in tech. They have a way of becoming permanent dependencies. Mark Zuckerberg made a stunning prediction. Within 12 to 18 months, most of Meta's code will be written by AI agents, not autocomplete, actual AI engineers that can set goals, run tests, and write better code than top human developers. Hub's research shows developers using AI complete tasks 55% faster and report significantly higher job satisfaction, but that's just productivity improvements. The real revolution is what individual developers can now accomplish. Single people are building applications that used to require teams of 50. Computer room from the 1940s. Notice anything strange about this computer room. There are no computers in it. In the 1940s, computer wasn't a product. It was a job title. These women were computers. They solved differential equations, calculated trajectories, and processed data using pencils and paper. Today, we have programmer rooms, cubicle farms full of humans writing code. But the wheel of time is turning again. Programming is becoming a commodity. The question isn't if, it's when. According to Gardner's 2025 forecast, global IT spending will hit $5.75 trillion. That's larger than the GDP of Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom combined. But here's what's about to blow a multi-trillion dollar hole through the side of this empire, artificial intelligence. And it's not coming, it's already here. Meet the generation of entrepreneurs, the automated founders, people who can build what used to require entire companies and create billion dollar empires in the process. Jan Kuhn came to America at 16 as a Ukrainian immigrant. No venture capital, no 100 person development team, no corporate partnerships, just one person with a vision for simple messaging. And his co-founder, Brian Acton, who joined later with Crucial Funding. Facebook acquired WhatsApp for $19 billion in February 2014 through the final price reached at $22 billion due to Facebook's rising stock value, making it one of the largest tech acquisitions in history. Daniel Ek taught himself to code as a teenager and became a millionaire at 23 before he even founded Spotify, starting with a simple idea to convert music pirates into paying customers. He and co-founder Martin Lawrenson built Spotify into a company now worth over $130 billion that revolutionized how the world consumes music. But here's what's about to change everything. Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, recently revealed something fascinating. He has a betting pool with his tech CEO friends for the first year there is a one-person billion dollar company. Quote, in my little group chat with my tech CEO friends, there's this betting pool for the first year that there is a one-person billion dollar company, which would have been unimaginable without AI and now will happen. This isn't theoretical anymore. Bolt that new went viral when developers started posting videos of building and deploying complete applications in minutes, not months. One developer tweeted, I built and deployed this note-taking app in literally two minutes. Another created a Google Meet-like interview platform in a dream analysis app in under nine minutes, both fully functional, both deployed live. You're watching AI generate database schemas, create API endpoints, build user interfaces, and deploy production-ready applications. What used to take development teams weeks now happens in minutes. Bolt and Netsupply just announced they've powered over 1 million AI-generated websites in five months, from November 2024 to March 2025. That's over 6,600 new applications deployed every single day on average. Is every app enterprise ready on day one? No. But for 80% of business applications, this is sufficient, and it eliminates vendor dependency entirely. The numbers tell a story. GitHub's latest survey shows 92% of US developers are using or planning to use AI tools. The shift isn't coming, it's already here. There's an entire movement of people building their own software instead of renting it. The rise of citizen developers, business professionals who build their own applications, is fundamentally changing who gets to create technology. We're witnessing the emergence of what I call intelligence equity, software that becomes more valuable over time instead of more expensive, because the intelligence lives in your systems, not your subscriptions. The software giants are scrambling. Microsoft invested $13 billion in OpenAI, their largest partnership deal ever. Oracle spent $6.5 billion acquiring AI startups in two years. SAP allocated $4.2 billion for AI integration. But they're making the same mistake IBM made in 1980, trying to bolt new technologies onto old business models instead of recognizing the fundamental shift. Because here's what they don't want you to realize. If one Ukrainian immigrant and his co-founder 
founder can build a $22 billion company, and one Swedish teenager with his partner can create a $130 billion empire, what happens when AI gives everyone those same superpowers? The age of the billion dollar solo founder isn't coming. According to Sam Altman and his CEO friends, it's already here. The financial impact is becoming visible. Software Equity Group's 2025 report shows something remarkable. 2024 saw 2,107 SaaS transactions, the second highest year on record. But the nature of these deals is changing. SaaS deals now account for 61% of all software M&A activity, but increasingly buyers are looking for AI native solutions rather than traditional software subscriptions. Gartner predicts that by 2028, 75% of enterprise software engineers will use AI code assistance, up from less than 10% in early 2023. The shift from renting software to building intelligence is accelerating. The numbers tell the story of what's coming. 78% of organizations now use AI in at least one business function, up from 55% just one year ago. Gartner predicts 80% of the engineering workforce will need to upskill by 2027 as AI transforms how software gets built. IDC forecasts that AI platform softwares will grow to $153 billion by 2028. While while generative AI software services will surge from $2.8 billion in 2023 to $39.6 billion by 2028, a 1,300% increase. But the real story isn't just size, it's acceleration. Bloomberg Intelligence predicts the entire generative AI market will explode from $40 billion in 2022 to $1.3 trillion by 2032, growing at 42% annually. Because after the dot-com crash, five companies emerged from the ashes. Google Google, Amazon, Meta, Apple, and Microsoft. Today, they're worth more than $9 trillion combined, making them collectively the 15th largest economy in the world if they were a country. In 1985, IBM commanded 6.3% of the entire S&P 500, more influence than Apple has today at around 6.4%. But when the PC revolution came, the giants who missed the shift became footnotes of business school case studies. This isn't speculation. This is statistical projection based on current trends. IDC shows AI platforms grow growing at 40.6% annually. Gartner confirms three quarters of developers will use AI assistance within four years. McKinsey documents that nearly 80% of organizations are already adopting AI. The question isn't whether this transformation will happen, it's whether you'll be leading it or being led by it. The age of intelligence equity has begun. The tools are here, the community is growing, the future is being built by those bold enough to seize it. 44 years ago, Bill Gates walked into IBM and changed the world with a software deal nobody understood. Today, millions of founders are walking away from software deals entirely. The $5.75 trillion software industrial complex isn't dying because of conspiracy. It's dying because something better was born. Intelligence equity that appreciates over time instead of extracting value. We helped a construction company cut $388,000 in annual costs with $300 in AI tokens. The transformation isn't coming. It's here. Sam Altman's betting pool proves it. it the billion dollar solo founder era has begun. The question isn't whether intelligence intelligence equity will replace software rent. The question is, will you build equity or keep paying rent? You have two options to join the intelligence revolution. Option one, subscribe to the automated founder newsletter, free frameworks that have saved businesses millions of dollars. And option two, book your free consultation at getomega.ai, where we'll show you exactly where to build intelligence equity in your business. Mars fought Oracle in court in 2015. Today, they could just build their own system. The wheel of time is turning. Commoditization is inevitable but ownership, that's up to you. The transformation is real. The tools are proven. The community is growing. What will you stop renting and start owning first? Visit getomega.ai and stop paying software rent and start building intelligence equity today.